All right, it's tradition. We've had our music. Uh, unfortunately, Michael Richardson isn't here, who would normally be dressed extravagantly and dancing. Um, so uh, this is Dance, which is the Dane authentication for network clients everywhere. Um, I am Wes Hardiker. Uh, Joey, my co-chair, is unfortunately watching remote at the moment, um, but hopefully she will chime in at some point. Uh, we have a mailing list. Um, as a reminder, the note well applies to all working groups. Um, that includes um, you, and that includes this working group. If you don't understand the legal context of what the note well means and what it means to participate in an IETF working group, you should consult your legal counsel. Um, I am not legal counsel, so I will not try and uh, summarize this too much. Uh, do note that we have a lot of documents that talk about our standards of behavior, including how the internet process works, uh, working group processes and how they work, anti-harassment procedures, our expected code of conduct, uh, how the IETF deals with copyrights and patents, both in, in terms of um, and in terms of participation, and we have a privacy policy as well. Uh, the quick summary of our code of conduct guidelines: uh, how we expect all participants to behave in working group meetings, or we treat colleagues with respect. We speak slowly, unlike what I was doing before this and we limit the use of slang. Uh, we dispute ideas with reasoned argument. We use best engineering judgment. We find the best solution for the whole of the internet, not my particular problem. And we contribute to the ongoing work of the IETF and the group as a whole. Please keep in mind uh, that this is true not only just for what is spoken at the microphone, but also what goes into Jabber and, uh, well, it's no longer Jabber, um, and Meet Echo and Zulip, I should say. Everything is being recorded. That includes audio, it includes video, it includes um, Meet Echo chat as well. This is the general information about our working group. Um, it has, a, of course, a data tracker page, and uh, there's the high-level summary. We have a mailing list if you're not subscribed to it, and then we have a number of active drafts to consider. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this session is being recorded. Everybody will have to use the on-site tool or by scanning the QR code or use the tool, uh, uh, you can log in on your laptop in the agenda as well. Uh, we will, of course, be using the queue mechanism for determining who's going to speak at the microphone next um, with some, uh, some exceptions for authors that need to talk uh, about particular subjects continuously. The agenda today is uh, fairly short. Um, we. We just went through the, the introduction. Um, I do need note takers. Is there anybody willing to take notes for the session? It involves using the notepad. Um, it should not be one of the people that are planning on talking a lot. Havis, thank you very much. You know how to use the note taking tool? OK, excellent. Thanks very much. Um, it really, we, we just need the, the conversation. You don't have to copy the slides verbatim, just you know, uh, important points that were taken away. Um, we will have a discussion on the last call. Uh, we had our last call was November of last year. It's been an embarrassingly long time uh, that we need to finally get these last two documents out. They're basically ready to go. There's just the last couple of tweaks. Um, is Gail here from Appenick? He's remote. Oh, okay. Uh, Gail, I haven't seen slides yet. If you're still planning on presenting, which we would love to hear about your IoT authentication, can you please send the chair's slides as soon as possible? Um, and then finally, it, we will end with sort of the future of dance. Uh, dance has uh, lost a lot of energy. I, I feel like, you know, we went on, we partied until midnight. And now everybody is really tired of dancing. Um, and so we'll have to figure out if there's a future for this working group once we, we finish these uh, couple of documents that need to get out the door. Uh, so that'll be a sort of our concluding um, discussion at the end of the day. But, but keep that in mind as we go progress through things. Uh, with that, I'm going to dive into a second set of slides. So I've put together, um, I've taken all of the last call comments, and a lot of these were sort of discussed on the mailing list. Um, 
we're going to go through each of them a little bit of background first you know we we got a number of comments i think in general the documents look really really good uh, there's two documents as i mentioned both the date the draft ietf dance client auth document and the draft ietf dance tls client id uh, that have different purposes they're both fairly short documents there was some discussion on the list around them but but there was never sort of a final conclusion of everybody's in agreement so today's the day we're all going to be in agreement by the end of this meeting about every one of the issues I, we will verify it on the mailing list and then we're going to ship the documents off to the IESG. that's that's the plan to do that uh we'll have a, a quick discussion at um at for each of the last call comments that are sort of not fully resolved i'll i have slides that describe most of them there's a couple that um i'm hoping the author schumann is here and will Schumann, you're welcome to just come sit next to me if you want. You're, um, <laughs> you're going to be doing a lot of talking. Um, I have a proposed suggestion for a path forward for most of them. There's a couple with question marks. Um, and then you guys need to talk. We need the feedback from the people that um, have opinions about these particular comments. Uh, we'll take consensus. That's the chairs, that is. And then, then we'll dance and we'll be done, right? And we can verify the results on the list. So we're going to start with the dance client auth. Um, the first comment in question, so uh, any new participants in the audience? There's a couple. So, so just so you know, this is what I warn all new participants about. We're diving straight into issues and there's no presentation material that gives you any clue about what we're talking about. I apologize, that's uh, uh, buckle up because <laughs> this, is, this is how the real work gets done. Um, so the first comment was from Rick, and he, he suggested that we had examples for both domain names and uh, wildcards and Dane TA. Uh, the document has some examples um, for, you know, it's so easy to understand about how it's supposed to work. Um, we're sort of missing ones for these two cases. Um, I think there's a few options here. Um, we could find a volunteer to write some examples. Um, they're probably not needed. Protocol documents always benefit from examples, but it's not critical if, if nobody's willing to write one. Um, so having said that, is there anybody that feels we should definitely have examples or more even better is willing to write uh, examples? Schumann. <laughs> um, so why should I go just go sit there? <laughs> yeah, you can just come sit up here. Um, <laughs> so Schumann's, you know, an author on both of the two documents. So. Yeah, so my co-author is Victor Duchovny, so I don't know, he's usually remote. Does anyone know he's, he's around or? Yeah, I know, he's not around. Um, I actually spoke to him yesterday. He, he is not uh, participating this time around. I think he'd be willing to help wrap it up, but um, uh, he's not doing a whole lot of editing at the moment either. So. Okay, so I think, um, so I answered most of the last call comments um, back in July, right? And I think the problem was no one confirmed whether they uh, agreed with my suggestions or not. On this particular point, I said, uh, yeah, it's pretty easy. I can produce an example of wildcards and dainty. I don't actually understand the first example. Could you give an example for a domain name? What does that mean? So I think we need to get Rick to clarify what he meant, or if anyone else in the room knew what he meant, please speak up and let me know. But I mean, there are plenty of examples of wildcard Dane TA records, and we can easily, I mean, I could make one up. Uh, if anyone wants to give a specific example uh, they prefer for a particular application use case, um, be happy to, we'd be happy to review that and put that in the document. Yeah, I think some of these we will, we, we will not get through them all. I lied in the beginning. <laughs> um, so this one, I would say, why don't we plan on this? If we get somebody to write or an example or clarify them, then we'll do it. Otherwise, if you know a couple of weeks go by and we don't get any volunteers, then we'll let it go as is without examples. As I said, I don't think, you know, um, there, there's example RFCs that I think are really well written. The IMAP one is a great example in my opinion. The IMAP protocol has like an example for every single protocol option that makes it really readable. Um, it's better, it's better when we can pull that off. So um, this is actually one of the harder ones we'll, we'll go through and they change quite a bit. Uh, the next one's from Michael Richardson. Um, the transport label encoding may not be needed. Um, both DTLS and DTLS are functionally dual usable already. I was a little bit confused by this. I think it may be addressed in the current draft anyway because it already says that the transport label is not needed. So 
Right. So the transport label is um, one of the components of the owner name of the DNS record. And we gave examples of possible formats for client uh, TLSA records. We were not prescriptive. We said if, you do, if an application has a need to use something different and they don't need to differentiate the transport, they can do that. I mean, I expect those details to be written uh, in um, uh, application profiles of dance. So remember, I think the original goal was we would have a dance architecture document and then we'd have specific application profiles for the various IoT things, including LoRaWAN maybe, or uh, email transport security, et cetera. I would expect those kind of nitty gritty details about the format of the owner record of the TLSA record to be done in those documents. So in the general document, we give examples, but we're not prescriptive. So an application could define something else. So um, yeah, your suggestion is fine. We could leave it as it is, or we could uh, clarify that that's the intent of the document. All right. Uh, anybody else have opinions on this one? There's going to be a lot of people in this room without opinions. I'm just I'm reading that ahead of time. <laughs> All right. The next one is from um, Bob Moskowitz. Um, are there any privacy concerns because of client identity harvesting and dance? I actually thought this was a really good comment. Um, uh, Bob's actually here, yes. <laughs> um, so do we need better security consideration description? I, I actually thought this was great. Um, I, I don't think it needs to be long. You know, Bob, certainly if you want to suggest text, that is always uh, beneficial. Um, but I, I do think... Okay, uh, so Bob just volunteered from the back of the room that he will look at his comment and see what he can do. It doesn't, I don't think, need to be long, but we should mention that, you know, client identities encoded in the DNS, you know, may leak some information, right? Uh, yeah, and just uh, for the record, I did agree with your suggestion, uh, Bob, so we just have to come up with some suitable text. Uh, if there's anybody else that wants to speak on any of these, please let me know. I'm going to take notes in my to-do list action items, so uh, excuse the pause. Okay, I think this is an easy one. Um, why is there an exception that allows for a should when using an X509 certificate? Um, the, the suggestion from Michael is just to change it to a must. I think you agreed with that. Is that correct? So, no. I think my answer was actually a little bit more complicated. Uh, yeah, so um, basically, okay, let me try to go back to what I said. The reason there is a uh, should for the X509 certificate is, so then client authentication, there are different modes, right? You could use uh, X509 client authentication, but you don't have to. You can use, although this is not widely used in the field, you could use raw public key authentication where there is no certificate and the binding between the domain name and the public key is provided in the name record. In that case, you uh, must use the client ID extension because the protocol has no other way to extract the domain name identity of the client. But in, in, in cases where uh, X509 client certificate authentication is being used, you could extract it from the certificate. That's why it's a should. And there again, we didn't want to lock down the rules and say you must also use the the, the, the client ID extension, because maybe some applications have a reason to use one or the other. So uh, who's, this is Michael, right? So I, I, I think we need to get Michael to chime in to see if he agrees or not with, with what I said, or if anyone else has any comments on this. All right, anybody else have comments on this one? Um, I think, um, I think your explanation makes sense to me. Um, so if if you've already explained it to him, then yeah, we should get him to confirm on the list. But I think the conclusion is we will leave it as is given your explanation, uh, unless, you know, we always take everything to the list for, for last, uh, you know, chances for people to comment since uh, Michael's not here. 
Um, he, Michael's also the shepherd, by the way, to the document. So, uh, so a lot of his comments came out of uh, his review of this document. With a question like this, should there, should there be a little more, you know, taking what you just said and putting that into the document? Yeah, so Bob, I think we did try to explain it in the document. Maybe it's not explained clearly enough, which is what prompted this question. So I can go back and review what's there. And if it needs further elaboration, uh, I can do that. Or perhaps you, since you asked the question, maybe you can review the document. I'll have to look me. at myself. <laughs> we have all been here, but we get to shepherd something saying, something and say, okay, why did they ask this question? Did I not? be, or somebody like that, did I not make it clear enough kind of a thing? So that, that's, that's, why, that's just why I came to the mic. When I look at this particular question, I said, hmm, I'd have to look at what a ref, particularly what a reference is there. Okay. All right. How about this? I'll, I'll go back and review again and see if there's any way to make the rationale that I just cited clearer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, Bob, your, your suggestion is 100% valid that that if there was confusion, then an extra sentence in the document would go a long way to, to making sure that that was well understood. Uh, thank you for that. Um, all right, so I put that down as uh, Shimon, we'll see if it's further, if further el elaboration would be necessary, but otherwise we'll leave it as is with that extra text. All right, the last one from Michael is um, smaller wording suggests that you know, there's a bunch of nits that he had, um, and I, I actually put the email message ID to look for it, but basically they're all just wording nits, things like using square bracket service to, to better delineate that it's, it's an example, it's not actually real world text and things like that. Uh, they were all straightforward. I, I think we'll just accept those and move on unless somebody wants to fight over a nit, so. Um, so we're halfway done, that was one document. Downside, I put the harder one second. All right, so we need a check regarding the supported TLS version. I actually think this is agreed upon, but I'm bringing it here to make sure that it is. Um, we have references to TLS 1.2 and 1.3 and DTLS 1.3, and we have a reference to 844.6, which is the framing extension. Um, this is actually, I think, the suggested text that somebody said that, that uh, this extension supports these two and future TLS versions uh, so that we say, you know, if a future TLS version works as a sort of standard boilerplate for uh, supporting, uh, you know, continually updating protocols like TLS and DTLS. Um, so I think this suggested text and uh, would be included in the, in the paragraph now that talks about TLS, it's an easy cut and paste reception. I'll give you the slides so you can cut and paste them. Um, and then the other thing that was talked about was whether a reference to 6066 was, is needed. And I think the conclusion from the mailing list was it really isn't needed. That's TLS extensions. We're already pointing at TLS, which points at the extensions. So there's no reason to do that. Uh, anybody with comments on this one? Is this the suggested text then, this blob here in the center? Okay, yep, that seems fine to me. Yeah, I, I guess the one issue with future TLS versions is we can't really anticipate whether the extension in its current form will work with TLS 1.4. Because remember, TLS 1.2 and 1.3 differed, so the uh, way the extension is positioned is it differs between those protocols. In TLS 1.2, we have to put it in the client hello, the first flight message, uh, which is unencrypted, which is a potential privacy concern. In TLS 1.3, uh, there are extensions in the certificate message which are encrypted, so we put it there. So it's a better option. So if TLS 1.3 has some new mechanism, then this protocol may have to change anyway. So I, I don't know if it's correct to say that the specification in its current form will definitely work with future TLS versions because there may be some architectural change to the protocol which may need this to be updated. Greg, go ahead. Um, maybe then the wording should be um, and future TLS versions as far as we are aware at the moment. So just qualify it. 
Okay, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, th the other thing that we can do is, be, you know, put in some fuzzy wording. I think that I, I hate this question, right? This is this happens all the time in the IETF for dependencies. Um, we can add the fuzzy wording, and and you could also add some wording of, you know, where wherever it's appropriate to stick extensions, so that you sort of get a hint that you know if they had if they had yet another place to put an extension to the protocol, that that in theory it should just be able to slide right in, but. Um, Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so these get worse in complexity. The final slide, I'm going to leave it all to you because I'm clueless. Um, so this one, actually, I, I, I get. There's a request for clarity on the client name lim limit definition. And the, the, the issue is we have multiple places where names can exist. Um, DNS names you know, on the wire can be zero bytes. Um, DNS names can be just the dot when you're talking about the root. Uh, we define the Dane client ID extension as 1 to 255. Um, I think in written out, can they can actually be verbally written longer than 255? I, I don't remember. Yeah, this is a slightly tricky one. So ideally, what we could have done, and I, uh, I think we did contemplate this, is we could have used, uh, said the uh, client ID is defined to be a, a domain name in uh, wire format. So that is strictly... 255 or less, it cannot be anymore, right? But what we did was, because this is TLS, and we were talking to TLS folks, TLS typically represents host names in text form, okay? So we did the textual presentation format of the domain name, and there it gets trickier because you don't necessarily know, it might be off by you know, a few bytes, maybe less or more. I don't know, I haven't calculated it myself, so, but, I don't know if this is a practical problem because I don't think rarely do we see domain names that long. So, yeah, I, I think that we can make it work where it's going to work for the 99% case. I'm staring at Mark, who is like staring at the slide and calculating the possible extensions, and I know it's in his head. Um, <laughs> he's the only person in this room that is probably in his head. Uh, the limit for names if you go out of LDH is four K, is 1K, roughly. I'd have to do the calculation. <laughs> but um, given you backslash digit, 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 multiply that by 256, and then take away the, the label separators and things like that, uh, it's just under 1K. Uh. Are you sure about that? I mean, I thought the DNS protocol says domain names have a maximum length of 255 octets. Host names have a maximum length of that because you're limited to letter, digit, hyphen. Uh -huh. Once you go to presentation format, everything multiplies by four. Say that again? The wire, the wire is 255, right. right, okay. And then you've got to worry about whether you got period, uh, trailing period or not, um, if you go to 952, RFC 952, it says 255, but you, 256, whatever the number is, but you can't actually encode that in it on the wire format, is not by one error there. <laughs> so the maximum, the maximum host name in 952 is one bigger than you can put in a DNS message, in a DNS no. QNA. <laughs> okay, so should we make this one bigger then? <laughs> no. Just, just, <laughs> just say it's a, the wire limit is 255. And DNS presentation formats is up to two, 
up but to approximately 1,024, one depending upon what's encoded in that in those lab. So this is labels. presentation format. That's the problem. This yes. is not wire format. Correct. So why, wire format's well defined. So is there any limitation on why we couldn't go to 1024 to cover everything well, right? And and so I don't know if there's yeah. a, if there's an issue with TLS or if there's an issue with. I, I don't know. I mean, I'll have yeah. to think about that. So uh, yeah, Mark, maybe you and I can talk about this later, and then we'll come up with a uh, suggestion. But there's more here. Right? <laughs> okay, this is very complicated. I <laughs> need some time to read this slide. Mm. Okay, the first part is done, right? The second part is the decode error alert. Okay, I vaguely remember this one. Okay, so I think uh, the answer, I think this came from Rick Van Rijm. He's saying that if we include an empty client uh, ID extension, according to the way the protocol is written, that will be an error, and then you'll get a TLS alert and shut down the connection. And uh, we do, um, have an option to send an empty extension from the server to advertise the fact that it supports this uh, this mechanism. Uh, it, it won't cause an alert to be sent because the way we have defined the extension is it can either be at empty or if it has extension data, then it has the presentation format domain name. So I think that covers it, but it's not written in TLS presentation syntax like, you know, can be empty or not. We just like verbally said it could be empty, but if it's not empty, here's the syntax for the uh, for the client ID extension. So if there's a better way to write that in TLS presentation syntax, then uh, I'd be happy to accept it, but I am not an expert in that language. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Any TLS experts here that know how to write extensions <laughs> or the TLS struct format really well? If not, we can probably go find Ecker at some point, and I'm sure he could answer us in 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> okay, five seconds for Ecker. <laughs> um, so that's that's probably the right thing to do because uh, we do want to get it right, and and because it's going to be reviewed later, and somebody will see it, so we should get it right out the door. All right, so I think the two conclusions are uh, Mark and Schumann are going to work together to get the right length for 255. Um, and then we'll work with Echo or something to figure out if there's a better way to write the TLS presentation format. Um, the other thing to note is, is the one was sort of in question too, because if you're removing the trailing dot, then you could never have one of these records for the root. I don't think we're ever going to have a client name that will be the root. So I don't see that personally as a problem. Yeah, so I don't remember why it was started with one, but that's probably the reason. I just can't remember. Okay, uh, on to the next one. I think this, I'm actually not positive which, uh, where, where this original comment derived from. Um, I didn't get back to search through the archives properly for that. Um, there was suggestions on, on making requirements stiffer in order to improve interoperability and reduce code complexity. And I think this was centered around when using X59 certificates, it should send this extension and as a signaling mechanism. So I wasn't sure about this one personally because I was thinking, aren't there times where, so you know you want the server to send it if they support it, right? And I think that's in there now as a must, but I don't know that the client sh should must send it. It wouldn't it depend on a use case, right? Yeah, I think that was more or less the answer that I gave. Uh, if it was a greenfield deployment where you know all clients do this, then yeah. But I mean, there's lots of mixed mode deployments where they, you know, may or may not do this. So I think that's the reason. I don't think it should be a must. Um, yeah, but I'd like to hear if there are any dissenting 
opinions. All right, so I think the conclusion is uh, the suggestion that is on the slide is actually wrong. We are going to leave it as a should. Um, and I, I, again, taking Bob's advice previously, right, we might want to add a sentence why, right? All right, the draft should say what resource record content it expects. And um, I think the interpretation of this comment was that Dane has multiple usage models now. Should we specify which ones are usable in this context? Um, and then the suggestion that I think came out of the conversations was to just drop it as it adds more strictness than is necessary. And there was disagreement about whether or not this should go into the document versus a more specific one if needed. Um, but you might have better contact. Uh, yeah, I think I agree with you, Wes. Uh, I think this is what I said back to, uh, to Bob. Uh, I think um, we don't want to be too strict in the protocol document. If there's an application profile that wants to enforce things, like you can only use Dane TA modes or selector this or matching type that, they can say that. They can be stricter. But I think the general protocol document should not say that because it may unnecessarily restrain some application that wanted to use this um, because of what we said, we were too strict. All right, for the record, Bob said, okay, from the back of the room, appreciate it. Yeah, so you know, one of the things that, that Dan sort of decided to do toward the end is have a generic document then that might other have other lots of little tiny RFCs publishing extra details or extra requirements about that particular use case. Uh, all right, so the conclusion is we will leave it as is, um, and application-specific profiles might make it more strict. Um, the last one, um, hoping you understand better than I do, um, uh, Joey said she understood it. Uh, use case for mixed environments in terms of certificate authorities. Um, it likely, I think that this was, uh, Joey reminded me, this was most likely in the context of an ownership change of, of records and things like that. Um, I, th I think that the goal was to explain that situation and how it would actually work out or something. Um, so it gets back to sort of an example. Yeah, I think... Um... I would like to get some more information from Rick from what he means by mixed environments. I remember I had a discussion with him uh, at some point where I thought he meant mixed environments in terms of authentication. Um, so client authentication or not, or you would prompt for authentication later in the TLS session. And we don't address that because that's part of the TLS spec and they can do that, right? So you can do in TLS 1.2, you could do uh, renegotiation or, or 1.3, you could do post handshake authentication. There are a bunch of mechanisms. We didn't want to get into those details. Um, if he means mixed environments in terms of what certificate authorities are supported, um, uh, I'm not sure that this document, again, needs to say anything. We can leave those details to the TLS framework, I think. But uh, I'm open to suggestions or inputs. I don't think anyone else has commented and you know, given any suggested text, so I'm just, I've just been sitting on it. OK. The queue is annoyingly quiet. There's, there's never any yellow bubbles to, to have people come talk. <laughs> This, you know, as I said earlier, this was a, the going down issue by issue is never a fun presentation, but it really needed to be done. Um, so with that, that is actually the last of these issues. I think we resolved the majority of them, and then there's two or three that we need to do some follow-up on, but that's better than where we were at the start of the day, right? So 
Um, I think with that, uh, thank you, Shuman, for the help. Uh, you're welcome to sit there if you like. I don't care. <laughs> um, and then we will go back to the agenda uh, where we actually have a potential use case. One of the interesting things about this group is that we actually have had um, various people. Oops, that's the wrong presentation. That's why the agenda is not there. Uh, various people that have actually come up with real world use cases of deployment. So, uh, Gael, um, if you are ready, um, you should be able to uh, offer to come in and speak and turn on your microphone if you like and video if you like. And uh, you can potentially share. Okay. Excellent. Oh, you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can. It's not listed. So, hold on one sec. There actually is a way to upload brand new slides now, which um, that was always a problem before. But uh, I got them uploaded. And now I need to confirm. I think you can request uh, slide control if you want, or I'd be happy to change them for you either way. Uh, I'm not sure where I'm requesting control, but. Uh... Okay, uh, I can ask you to change slides. Yeah, I'll do it, no problem. Okay. Uh, so yes, I'm going to present the work that we've been doing at AFNIC uh, in using Dane and Dance to authenticate IoT devices. So in Laura one, uh, so I'm just going to mute. Okay. Uh, in Laura one, there is uh, the uh, radio frequency space and the IP space just for the report. And Laura one is a long range, uh, low power uh, radio technology for IoT devices and specifically constraints devices. So in the, um, when a device wants to join a, a network or the network, it will send a join request that will be relayed by a network server to reach finally a join server. And the join server will answer back a join answer message that the network server would relay back to the device. So this process is authenticated using the uh, message integrity code for the request and it would be encrypted for the answer. And the device and the drone server are sharing um, a pressured key. So that was a bit of background on our one. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the issue with the uh, joint procedure in our one is that we are using a, a, a shared secret. So there is an issue with um, delivering this uh, secret to uh, all actors of the network, so the joint server on one side and the manufacturer on the other. So it has uh, come up in the discussion, why not use uh, asymmetric cryptography? So in which case we will have a pair of keys, so a joint server public key and the device private key on the device and the joint server private key and the device public key on the joint server. And then we will be able to compute a shared secret using a elliptic curve development, for example. But then we need to uh, deliver the join of uh, the uh, joint server public key to the device, um, which most of the case would be uh, embedded at manufacturing time, which is not uh, very convenient in this case. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we try to resolve this issue using DNS and using specifically Dane and Dance to uh, convey the public keys. So the problem that we had so is how the device authenticates the server as being the one it wants to join, and the reverse, how the server verified that the device is actually the one that it, it says it is. So for the next presentation, I will present the proof of concept that we uh, developed. So we used uh, asymmetric cryptography and specifically elliptic curve. Uh, we used a broad public key in the TLSA records. And uh, when the device wants to join the network, uh, the only thing it knows is its own private key and a shared DNS trust anchored. And of course, the uh, idea of the joint server it wants to join. Uh, next slide. 
So normally, um, when the device uh, send the join request, the join request is composed of the join UI, which is the ID of the join server, the device UI, which is the ID of the device, and then a, a random nonce, and the message entry code, which is used as an authentication code in this case. And what we try to do is to change that because we don't have any um, shared secret to compute the message entry code anymore. But we have uh, asymmetric cryptography. Sorry, we compute instead the signature of the message. Uh, so here, here we're using ECGSA, and the signature will be 64 bytes, which is a 60 byte overhead compared to the original message. Uh, next slide. So upon reception of this uh, request, the joint server can extract the JVOI from the joint request and fetch the corresponding TLSI records, and then validate the authenticity of that record using DNSSEC, of course. And then uh, once it extracts the public key of the uh, TLSI record, it can validate the signature of the um, request and then authenticate the device. But once the public key is um, has been found, it can also compute a shared secret using uh, ECGSH. So here I uh, played out an example of the um, data theory code that we use. So we have like a prefix um, that is lower joint than the uh, device uh, ID that has been reversed because uh, they're hierarchical. And then we have a, um, a common uh, namespace. Uh, next slide. So once the server has been able to compute the shared secret, it can now construct the join accept message. So normally the join accept would just be an encrypted blob containing a bunch of configuration for the device to use and then the message integrity code. So this payload would be uh, normally encrypted using the application key, which is the shared secret. In our case, the application key has been computed so we can still uh, uh, encrypt this payload, but the device uh, does not know uh, the secret, so we will attach to the, this message the DNSSEC chain uh, that will contain all the records for the device to uh, validate the chain. Um, and the message integrity code has been uh, just filled with a zero adding here, uh, just because, I mean, it could be improved at just a proof of concept at this point. Uh, next slide. So the construction of the GNSSEC chain uh, has been based on the GNS, uh, GNSSEC chain extension, RFC, but we are making it a few shortcuts. So we are not supporting any C names or D names because it will increase the size of the chain by a lot. And we also use an intermediary trust anchor. So because every device will be in the same namespace and every joint server will be in the same namespace, we can have a shared trust, trust anchor that is not the root. So we are also reducing the size of the chain here, and we also um, limit ourselves to a single DNSSEC algorithm. So here, which is ECDSI, because we also are using ECDSI uh, other places in the in this whole uh, thing. Um, and also, we can uh, reduce the size of the chain by compressing the keys in this case. Next slide. So the chain itself has been encoded in CBOR uh, using a format that has been used inspired by a draft uh, defining a CBOR representation of DNS messages by Martin Landers. Uh, it assumed the well, the, we're making a few assumptions here to reduce again the size of the payload. So the protocol build is assumed to be a three all the time. Uh, I mean, for now it's okay. <laughs> Hopefully, will be in the future. But uh, we also compress the ECDSA keys uh, in the GNS key and the TLSA resource records to reduce the size of the key by almost half the size. We omit all the, the you know, redundant information. So if the TTL or name has not changed uh, compared to the previous error set in the chain, we are not including it. And all the names are relative to the previous one because we are in the same tree. So that is possible. And then all the records are sorted in a way that is uh, easy for the device to verify the, 
the chain and inside the error sets, uh, the error data is also sorted uh, in the canonical format to uh, speed up the uh, verification and is the verification for the device. Next slide, please. So here is the uh, format of the um, GNSEC chain. So this is basically what I just said. But so the um, error set is composed of a type, optionally a name, and a TTL, and a list of uh, error data, and a list of signatures. Um, and the DNS key uh, of the TLSA records, uh, and the, um, well, or the, or the keys of the TLSA records and the DNS keys are um, compressed here, so the size is only uh, 33 bytes. Uh, next slide. So uh, even if we are compressing this chain, it is much too big for to be transmitted in one payload here. So we are fragmenting everything um, using a very simple fragmentation uh, process. So we have a header that is just one byte with a bit uh, being just a flag, uh, just telling uh, as, uh, that it is the last fragment and then an index. And the uh, fragment is always requested by the device uh, uh, to support the most constrained devices that can all only uh, receive data when they request some data. So this also allows for the device to re-request a fragment if uh, the device has not received it. Uh, next slide, please. So upon reception of the uh, all join except the device can validate the, um, the, the payload and authenticate the joint server. So it will first validate the genetic chain using the shared trust anchor then validate that the TLSA record corresponds to the um, journey UI that the device uh, has requested to join. And then extract the um, public key from the TLSA records and then compute the shared secret from them. It's almost a normal lower one um, operation because you can just decode the payload and configure the device and resume operation normally. Uh, next slide. So uh, the Evaluation of this work is still a work in progress, but uh, so far with well, the highest data rate, we're able to join the device. But the device is able to join in about 30 seconds. Most of that time is just the device waiting for a receiving window. Uh, the compressed uh, form of the chain is still much uh, better than the uncompressed red format. So even if we're still fragmenting everything in the uncompressed red format, it will almost double the time it takes for the device to join. And this is with the one of the highest data rate here is about 200 bytes per packet. So if we have a lower data rates like 50 or 100 bytes a, a packet, it will be much higher. So there are some uh, issues that we need to solve, like the uh, join request still being too big for the lowest data rate uh, because we're having like 82 bytes uh, and one of the lowest data rate in Europe, for example, is 51 bytes. So, but uh, it's still, it shows that it is possible uh, to use uh, DNS here to, to authenticate devices and server uh, in an IoT use case. So, whether or not it could be applicable to LoRa 1 or something else, this is something for the future. Uh, thank you. I think that's all. And you have the link uh, of the proof of concept here in my email if you have any uh, question or remark. Okay, thank you, Mitch. Um, uh, very interesting work. Um, I, we already have one person in the queue, so uh, Bob, please go ahead. It's a nit on slide nine. Um, a uncompressed ECDSA key is 65 bytes. You okay. always have that one byte which says, what is the format for the ECDSA public key? So is it the 64 or the 32? So it's either 65 or 33. That's just a nit, but just to let you know that you always have that one byte. Okay, thank you. I, I have thought through there because I spent a lot of time looking at ECDSA over EDDSA. That's why, no, it just, it just jumps out at me. I was going to say, this sounds like very similar problem space to what Drip is trying to deal with um, for packet size issues, yeah, so. Yes, yes, that's why I specify. Right, all right, thanks very much. Uh, Andrew. Uh, hi, uh, Andrew, Andrew S, UK NCSC. Um, 
a quick thought is, um, I know this is all classical cryptography, with post-quantum, the key size is going to get much bigger. I know this seems like quite a constrained environment, so that might be something to consider going forward, because I think that might cause some problems. Thanks. Yeah, I think you're right. We have a, a lot of that coming. Go ahead, Bob. <laughs> um, with regard to post-quantum computing and any of these constrained um, networks, we can't do it. We simply cannot do it. Um, I've, um, I've spoken extensively with NIST and others involved with it because it's a very, very real concern in the work that I'm doing. And it's like TBD, we don't know on the blaze what we're going to do or if you have to worry about it even for 10 years. So, uh, you know, stay tuned kind of a thing. Um, a bit, you, may, you may have to put some sort of text in there and on constrained links, uh, um, post-quantum keys don't work yet. Yep, I, I think that's going to be a problem for all low bandwidth situations of, of how to deal with that, especially high latency, low bandwidth situations when you combine them both. Um, uh, so I joined the Q2. I actually had one question too. I didn't try and do a security evaluation of the whole uh, presentation. I really appreciate your, um, your, your presentation. Is, so I guess two questions. One, is this deployed live today? Are, are you actually you know, fielding this or is this sort of, you said it's still work in progress, but you know, how far along on it are you on that? Uh, so uh, this is all research work. So we've been doing a proof of concept where we've man uh, managed to to make that work with a real device, but it's not deployed uh, in a very like, industrial way. That's the question. Okay. That makes sense. And then my second question was: um, this slide caught me with respect to you're only using one DNSSEC algorithm, and so you yeah. know, and, and sort of similar to what Bob was saying uh, about you know, future cryptography related things, uh, you know, in the IETF, we, we have a requirement, I realize you're not, you know, doing this in the IETF, but we have a requirement for al algorithm agility. So doing things like fixating something on, on a single algorithm, there's a lot of security professionals that would say that's a very dangerous thing to do. Yeah, uh, well, I agree on that, that, uh, that point, uh, which is, I mean, which is one, this algorithm here, because of the constraint of the device, but, uh, is, I mean, in theory, you could um, use any algorithm if the device is ready to accept it, I would say. Yep, understood. Uh, Schumann? Um, yeah, so one question. I'm uh, glad to hear that you're using ideas from the TLS DNSSEC chain extension. Um, so when we designed that, we really didn't have uh, con very constrained <laughs> devices in mind as a potential uh, usage. So that's why um, it says to use uncompressed wire format domain names, which of course causes you a problem. Uh, the DNS protocol uh, has a compression scheme, it's named compression, but we couldn't use that because that's based on offsets from the beginning of a DNS message. And this is not a DNS message, the chain extension is a sequence of DNS records. So we'd have to invent a new uh, compression scheme. Uh, so my question was, the CBOR compression of DNS messages scheme that you're using, I think you mentioned there was a draft. Uh, I wanted to ask, what is the status of that draft and where, where, where is it being worked on? Uh, uh, so um, the, the, the format has been loosely inspired by this uh, draft, but it's not uh, compared on this draft totally. I've spoken to the author of the draft, and there is a few things that I could change in the format I'm using to make it a bit more compliant. And also the fact that currently the draft does not support DNSSEC. And I think it's, I'm not sure what is being discussed uh, right now. I think it was brought up in DNSSEC at some point, but I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. And uh, otherwise, the, uh, it was the board working group. I don't know which one it is. I was thinking it might be useful to get some uh, DNS protocol people to review that draft, and uh, particularly for the chain extension, maybe we can see if we should uh, uh, extend that to use it, if it's in reasonable shape for consideration. Well, I think the author of the draft is, uh, has planned to, to make it uh... Well, to go with, uh, along with the GNS people to review it, so. Okay, and then let me slip in another question. This is more of an operational yep. question rather than a protocol question. 
you mentioned you're managing intermediate trust anchors, so you don't have to self send the full chain from yeah. the root. Uh, I'm just curious, how how do you maintain and manage that in your system, or how are you proposing to do it if you haven't deployed it in production? Uh, like, so it changes. So in this application, it is possible to do it because uh, everything is under the, the same namespace. Uh, so it will be the same as matching uh, the what I is uh, providing the uh, root uh, trust anchor into the device. Uh, I mean, managing one trust anchor or the other, I don't think it very differently. Not sure. I, I don't think that answers your question. Okay, yeah, I, I'll follow up with you. I have a few more details to share, uh, ask you about, but I'll, I can do yeah. that one. Okay, I hope it is for you. Thanks, yeah. All right, thank you very much for the presentation. I uh, appreciate it greatly. And so that brings us to five minutes left uh, before the end of the meeting. Um, and as I promised, sort of the last thing that we were going to talk about is, is there a future of this group? So assuming we get the two critical documents out the door, which is really the whole point of forming the group, uh, we have one more on our existing charter, which is the architecture draft. And uh, it seems to have fallen in activity to the point where um, somebody would have to offer to spend a lot of work to pick it up and, and uh, bring it to fruition. And when this working group was originally formed, uh, there was a, a, a strong push to um, do future work afterwards. There was all, you know, use cases and all sorts of other stuff. So there's a real question in my mind of, um, is there a future beyond the point where we get these last two documents out the door? And no is a perfectly acceptable answer. You know, we getting two documents out and actually having the protocol uh, defined and in place. Um, you know, we can spin things back up later if, if you know, there's a, a sudden spin up of, of energy. But, uh, you know, unless I hear unless Joey and I should say here from people that are, you know, wanting to do new work in this group. Um, it's most likely that this working group will be shut down. I've talked to the quality area director about it. Um, if anybody has comments about that now, great time to speak up and um, especially if you have ideas of things that you want to work on and, and uh, drafts you want to propose, some of it would require rechartering, of course. But I, uh, yes, I love, go ahead. Yaroslav, for someone who's this scaler, um, one aspect that seems to me to be a gray area, and I wonder if this is something that should be part of this working group, is identity provisioning. Unlike servers, you, well, servers are typically static, and typically there are not that many of them. So um, there are ways how organizations uh, provision certificates and cryptographic materials and maintain that with servers. With clients, especially when it comes to IoT, environments are very, very dynamic. Um, there are lots of changes going on, different scale requirements. So I think some guidance frameworks, maybe standards when it comes to identity provisioning uh, could be a very interesting topic. Again, not sure if there is an appetite to have this as a part of this working group or should we take it somewhere else? Uh, excellent question. There's a lot of identity related discussions happening in the IETF right now, including a BOP this week on identity management and stuff like that. So what I would suggest you do is write up a description of how you think that would work with dance and just just a couple of paragraphs so that you can send it to the mailing list and then we can discuss it there if, and, and be willing to say I'm willing to author a document. That's, you know, of course, what we need the most. Um, and if we can get, you know, momentum around that, fantastic. Um, so. Uh, thank you. Due to time, I'm, I'm going to cut the queue, but uh, Jacques and then Bob after that. Jacques, you're on the yeah, line. so very quickly, so we wrote an internet draft to link digital credentials to Dane or TLSA records. I think that's an implementation of Dance. Um, but if we use it as is, I don't think we need to do more than this. It's, it's more around the usage of Dane records, not the protocol itself in the DNS, so. Oh. <clears throat> right, so there's pre-existing work that you can 
look at too, in other words. In fair, there's a lot of detail. It's, it's really useful to use dance for digital credentials, but I don't think this is the right working group to define the, the usage around it. Okay. Uh, still starting with the description would be good and then Jack can also type in uh, reference to his document as well. Bob, go ahead. If I understand the point properly, um, it becomes very usage based. What are these dance identities being put in there for what use? And pretty much that particular use case is going to have its identity management case that's going to populate the dance record, the TLS say records. And that's specifically what I'm going to be doing from, from, from my usage. So I don't see that that being, you know, that you come up with any generalized approach to that. And so it's like, you want to use TLSA for clients, you know, figure out how you're going to get them populated. Yeah, and there, there have been uh, deployment discussions in the past. Um, one thing, of course, we would love is a, you know, internet-wide multi-architecture kind of thing. But, but what has been discussed from the very beginning of dance is actually much more focused on I have one specific use case. I think one of the early, you know, descriptions was cars driving into a garage and, you know, multiple vendors with a car and, and you could pre-deploy the right things with, and then, you know, publish uh, client keys in the DNS by the manufacturer where you get cross manufacturer, you know, TA anchoring and things like that. But narrow scopes, and I was speaking with Roman this morning, actually, um, who was one of the ADs that helped start this group, and he was saying even narrow deployments would be great, right? You know, any usage of the resulting technology is good, even if it's not, I have a client that I can use, you know, halfway around the world to somebody that's never heard of anything before. Well, we, I have complete plan of using TLSA records for the various devices, and then make it to, that it'll be usable in, in that. Right. It's, is it tied to dance uh, documents directly, or is it sort of in the, the in, in the drip documents, a couple of them which we're, I hope to get adopted soon. We um, we I reference dance. You know, that if you if it, now now that you got your identities, now you want to do DTLS. Here's how the how the the uh, the client identity detail um, TLSA record got populated. Okay, thanks very much. I, if you drop a note to, to dance about that, you know, not everybody follows Drip as well, so that would be fantastic. Just to let us know that you oh, know, yeah. success is in the works. Well, right? After the meeting, to, the, the Drip meeting tomorrow, if I get those documents adopted. <laughs> all right. All right, with that, we're a couple of minutes over time. Uh, thank you all for coming. The conclusion for that discussion is we won't close the working group immediately. We are going to have a discussion on the mailing list about the future, and, and we'll see what happens. But uh, good progress today overall. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. And uh, I'll have to keep finding new, new initial graphics if you guys keep making me you know, share these things. So they've been different every time. <laughs>